There was a very interesting question once put to Master and a much more interesting answer. The question was by a disciple who was a bit shaky in his attunement. And the disciple asked, Sir, will I ever fall from the spiritual path? In fact, he did years later. But Master's answer was fascinating. He said, how could you? Everyone in the world is on the spiritual path. Master saw what would happen. He didn't want to discourage the boy. But uh, this truth that everyone is on it, whether he falls or doesn't fall, is a very interesting fact. We're all on the path because there is no other path. Now that may seem strange. You've got all sorts of directions to go in. But you know it's always heading toward the same mountaintop. You may be down in the field where the, there are lots of paths crossing and crisscrossing, going in different directions, some of them going away from the mountain. Sooner or later, all of them turn back to that mountain. Sooner or later, all of us have to embrace the reality of who we are. We were born of one reality. We are children of the infinite. There is no other reality. That's why you can't get off the path. God created everything out of himself. He dreamed it into existence. We don't have a separate existence. Satan himself is not separate from God. He's in a sense you might call an agent of God. But uh, that's a subtle subject that requires considerable discussion, which we're not going to get into today, today. The point is that nothing exists except his consciousness. He produced the whole drama of life. And speaking of drama, there is also putting yourself in the shoes of the playwright, let's say, as you're going to be seeing a play that I wrote called The Peace Treaty next Saturday. And uh, I had great fun writing that part where the villains get together. <laughs> and it was, it was a part of the show. And I think that God even enjoys all the roles. He enjoys the villain. He just sometimes thinks, now how villainous can I make him? But what's his real purpose? My purpose, and this is where you find that a lot of modern theater, drama, literature, everything has gone wrong. They revel in the evil. They make that the center of their attention. They make it as much as they can attractive and then leave you there wallowing in the mud. Whereas the purpose, as we see in the play, is to, and as Master said, the purpose of the villain is to make you love the hero. The purpose of evil is to make you see that the divine, the good, is what we all want. You know what brought me to the spiritual path? Well, many things, including just my own karma. But one thing particularly and immediately. I was in the Dock Street Theater in Charleston, South Carolina, learning stagecraft because I thought to be a playwright. Well, I don't know how much good playwrights have ever done in the world. There have been some great ones and mediocre ones and bad ones. But the greatest, how many lives have really been changed by, let's say, Shakespeare? Not so many. It, I'm glad I didn't go that way. But you know what brought me onto the path? Mixing with all these phony people. I just thought, this is not life. There's got to be something else. And I remember, and I've told you all this story, I, I was rooming with four of them, and uh, <clears throat> I went out at night. I had always been thinking, what is God? What is God? And I took this long walk into the night, and I thought, well, God can't be sort of like a policeman up there in the sky, waiting for us to go wrong so he can clap us in prison. If he exists, he's got to be consciousness. And if we're conscious, we have to be a part of his consciousness. And if that's so, then the closer we come to expressing his consciousness, the more will be what we really want to be. And the less we are in tune with that consciousness, I didn't use the word attunement, but I had that idea. The more we are cut off from our source and therefore plunged in a kind of suffering and darkness. 
And so the purpose of life has to be to live in harmony with that consciousness. And these thoughts were so novel to me. I hadn't read them. I had to figure it out for myself. And uh, I was just completely sort of dizzy with this depth of thinking. And I remember coming back to our, our apartment on South Battery. And <clears throat> going into the kitchen where these four guys were sort of sitting and laughing and joking, and I sat down and, and uh, they were looking at me and they said, What's wrong with Don? How is he all so serious about life shouldn't be so serious? And they kept trying to jock me along. <coughs> the more they thought like that and talked like that, the more I thought, That's not for me. There's just got to be something more, and that more, I found the key. That's what I'm going to do with my life. And from then on, I decided I would seek God. Now, you know, they were seeking God, too. They just didn't know that God was God. They thought God was drinking, God was fun, God was good times. There was, <coughs> there's a lot of idol worship going on. But they didn't know that what everybody wants is the bliss of his own being. They want pleasure and they want to escape pain. They don't know that in that pleasure is a hint of what they really want. Happiness, first of all. Whenever you find pleasure and make that your goal, you swing to the opposite. Because this world is made of duality and for every plus there's going to be a minus. You can't avoid it. Happiness is better, but you find that even in human happiness, it doesn't really last. Or if it lasts, it can last too long, become boring instead of happy. Like in this book that I've just been finishing doing, I thought it was finished, but it's not quite finished. <laughs> God is for everyone. And uh, in that book, I talk about People's, many people's dream of happiness is a lovely cottage by the sea and um, sort of like Sherlock Holmes when he retired with rose bushes and bees and the lovely surf and all the things that people dream of when they think of a life of peace. Well, okay, for a year, maybe for a few years, 10 years, I don't know. A lifetime, oh my God, eternity, ah! There comes a time when it becomes boring. Nothing that is external can ever make you what you really want, give you what you really want. It's got to come from inside. And the more we look for happiness, not outside ourselves, but inside, the more we find what we're really looking for. But that happiness is still emotional in a sense. It still has its opposite. Whereas there's a truth behind that that is the truth of the soul, and that's bliss, to which there is no opposite. That bliss is the motivator in everything that every creature does in this universe. We're all pulled forward, <coughs> consciously or unconsciously, by the desire for bliss. That is the spiritual path we all look for the bliss of our own being, and that is God. God isn't some person up on a cloud. God isn't sitting up there like a policeman waiting for you to make a mistake. God's inside you, and He always loves you. No matter what you do, you can't get away from that love. But there is always inside you that pull, because after all, He put you into creation, and that means an outward move. And so we've been, actually, the cards are stacked against us in a sense. And sometimes I'm not sure it's fair. But anyway, here we are. What we, we, we have to do what we can with it instead of worrying about the rights and wrongs of what he did. The plain fact is that when we're born, we're already born into a situation where our energy has to go outward. We've got a body. We've got to keep it fed, we've got to breathe, we've got to learn how to control our limbs and our bowels and all the various things that 
go with growing up? You're already, your energy is going outward and suddenly you get hit with these spiritual teachings that say, no, no, go within. And you think, what the hell for? <laughs> You're used to going outward. You're guided by habit. And so, whereas the true spiritual path is going within, the other side of it is that we're always taken away from that path by, well, desire. We are... We have many memories of uh, things that were pleasurable. I remember when I, when I gave up smoking. I was 21 and I had never smoked very much. Um, I gave away most of my cigarettes, but I still, I smoked. And I finally decided that I wanted to be a hermit. This was after that evening there in Charleston. And I thought, well, who ever heard of a hermit who smokes? <laughs> I mean, how, where, how could I afford cigarettes? <laughs> and so I decided, okay, I'd been trying for a long time to uh, think about this. Finally, I decided I, I would quit. But you know, it wasn't so easy. Habit was there. And uh, I, I remember that after a meal, I remembered how pleasant it was to smoke a cigarette after a meal or with a cup of coffee. And so I always fell back into it. Well, now here, and this is a very important point that I hit upon by chance or good karma or whatever you want to call it, but I really want to impress it on your minds because I didn't do what I could have done and what many people do do. I didn't say when I went back to smoking, oh, I've blown it again, I've failed, I'm no good, I'm weak, I'm whatever. I didn't say that. I simply said, I haven't yet succeeded. And so it was an affirmation of potential success, not an affirmation of failure. Now that's a very important point because we all have ideals. We don't probably, any of us, live up to them always. And sometimes there's a tendency to just really beat yourself if you go wrong, if you make a mistake. Don't do it, that's an affirmation of failure. Just tell yourself, I haven't yet done it. And so this went on for about a year, sort of on again and off again, until finally my affirmation of I haven't yet succeeded brought me to the point where one night I said, okay, I'm giving it up. And I really meant it. And you know one thing about affirmations, and it's a good point to remember also, if you can carry an affirmation into your subconscious, then it goes, it sort of changes the habit, pattern, habit patterns in your own subconscious. So I also went to sleep with that thought. I think that helped me. But I remember I called one of these roommates in, or I didn't call him, and he happened to come in for some reason or other, and I just told him, well, I've given up smoking. Ha, 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 we've heard that one before. I was very calm. I didn't respond. I wasn't a joke to me, and I wasn't something I was trying to boast about. I just said, well, we'll see. The next day I had no desire to smoke. Never have had another desire to smoke. Only once, two months later, I dreamed that I smoked. <laughs> <clears throat> and the joke of it was, I also dreamed that my father, who had given up smoking, smoked, and I felt so badly for him. <laughs> but that's just a quirk. <coughs> the fact is that you can, if you keep saying, I haven't yet succeeded, you can come back to what you really believe in. Now, what's the alternative? I've seen it happen. Gosh, I've been on this path now for, what, 55 years? That's a pretty long time in a short human life. Not long in eternity, but for us -ins, it's long enough. <laughs> And I have to say that I've seen a lot of people, a lot and a lot of people, going in all sorts of directions. And I've seen that there are certain patterns that flow, that work out, and that people, when they decide that, well, no, I, I don't think that I want to be that much of a fanatic. I'd rather really have a good time. I see them a little bit later and they aren't happy. They don't have what they really want. They can try to cover it up with boasting. 
but they don't have it. And I've seen people who really stick to their guns and it may be difficult. And it certainly is difficult. It's a lot easier to climb a mountain than fall down it. But of course when you fall, there may, you just never know what's going to happen. You could crash, you could kill yourself. And to kill your body is nothing but to, you don't kill your, your soul, but you can certainly ruin your consciousness for a long time to come when you turn away from who you are and from him who is there trying to help you because God wants to help you. God wants to lift you up, but if you turn him away, as Yogananda said to somebody, if you keep me out, how can I come in? We're the ones. I remember a disciple of his, Devi Mukherjee, not the one you all know, but another one who lived at Mount Washington. And uh, he was always joking and superficial and light-minded, and Master scolded him for this. And one day Devi said, well, sir, I, I know I want to help, I, but how can I do it without your blessings? Master said, my blessings are there already. God's blessings are there. It's your blessings that are lacking. In other words, we've got to do it too. You can't just sit back and say, well, God, do it. Take me. He's not going to take you. You've got to give yourself, then he'll accept you. So what we need to know is that there are possibilities for detours. And people may think that in that detour, they've finally found it. And I've seen this happen many times, that people will suddenly discover that, uh, for instance, one disciple that I knew, <coughs> he always had a certain subconscious interest and desire for science. And somebody who was a scientist told him, I think you could have been a really good scientist. Somehow this got into his subconscious. I could be a scientist. And that desire suddenly flared up. And you know, there are a lot of little subconscious desires. There was one uh, other disciple who wanted to be a musician and had instead given her life to God. But that music, desire to be a musician never left her. And I could tell in the way she spoke that there was, it was just there. Um, the the memory of wanting to be a science, that scientist, that thing that flared up like that, suddenly made him get out of tune. And he ended up not being a scientist. They never do. He just didn't follow God anymore. In fact, he turned against his own guru. Sad, but it does happen. Look at Judas, perfect example. Judas was a true disciple, a great soul. Master told me he was a prophet. But he had this desire for money. Interestingly, Master said that he knew Judas in this life. That Judas who had been liberated finally after 2,000 years. You might think after a sin like that, 2,000 years may not be much. After all, he was a disciple. He was a great disciple. But he had that little desire for money. And uh, <coughs> Jesus appeared to this master in India. That's what master told me and asked him to liberate him. And I, I said to him when he, he said I knew him, uh, I said, well, what was he like? Master said, oh, he's very much by himself and withdrawn. He still had a slight attachment to money. And the other disciples sort of ribbed him for it. And the, uh, the guru said, uh, don't, leave him alone. He knew what he'd gone through. But you know, it's an interesting thing in the case of that disciple that he had, uh, he had a lot of interest in money, but in a generous way. He wanted to get money for the guru. But he had that samskar, which he had transmuted. Still, it was always there, and he just purified it. But you see, out of the desire for money, he began to think, as Judas, that, uh, well, after all, what is this life here? Just living with no money, without practicality. Look at these people in the world. They know what to do. I've seen this happen. 
I've seen people suddenly think that worldly people, people of success in the world, <coughs> they know what it's all about. We're just a bunch of dodos here. I've seen people come into our publications building and see how we do things and, well, we're pretty efficient nowadays. We didn't used to be. In fact, in the early days, people would sort of drift in and out of the office as they liked. It took Save It, really. She came in every day at nine, and finally people began to feel, oh, all right. So they started coming in at nine. But we were basically, you might say, inefficient. And yet, somehow, we managed to make things work, and we got it together, and skills that we didn't have, we learned. But the interesting thing is that people with these skills often have thought that we ought, I ought to teach them how to do things. What I've seen, though, is that <coughs> people who get into that thought pull away from the spiritual path. There are many ways of doing the same things. You can be an accountant in all kinds of different ways. There are rules that have been evolved for being a good accountant. But they don't have to be always exactly like that. There are rules for running a business. They don't have to be exactly like that. It always seems to come back to, from your center, you can evolve the best ways of doing things. Look at art. There's so many ways of painting. But from your center, if you're inspired, from that center, you can come up with a whole new, different way. You know, the early Christians, they did a lot of artwork. Some of it's pretty funky, of course, because they weren't artists. But they were devotees, and somehow some of that art is really wonderful. Kind of primitive, but you can feel the devotion behind it, which is the real secret of art. Everything that you do, if you allow yourself to think, well, they know, we don't, what you find is that uh, you get out of tune. I know one, one devotee here, was, he was got it, drawn into that, that thought of success, worldly success. And he looked at a magazine and there was some fellow there in this magazine and he said, oh, he, he's, he's huge. What's huge about being famous for God's sake? The guy was in prison a week later. <coughs> Be true to your own funky self for God's sake. <laughs> Don't think you've got to do it this way or that way, but be true to who you are. And you'll find that if you are true, you'll do it well. It may be different, but it'll work. I know this, this uh, man came here, from, uh, Michael Meyerhofer, in fact, from Vienna. And he told me that uh, the way I saw them working in the office, just no system. Um, he just couldn't figure it out because not only was there no system, but everything worked. This, for his rigid Austrian mind, just didn't make sense. But I don't say be haphazard. No, I don't. When I've, I write, I'm extremely careful about trying to write as well as I possibly can. I may go over a manuscript 50 times before I'm satisfied. When you read it, you think, oh, he writes so easily. No, the answer is it reads easily, but it doesn't write easily. Just one word can make a lot of difference. And you have to beat your brains out looking for that word. And that may change the rhythm of the whole sentence, which means you have to rearrange all the other words. If it's five syllables instead of two, that changes everything. So there are lots of things to think about. And you have to be very conscious of it. But did I go to school and learn writing? I didn't. Did I go to school and learn music? No, I didn't. In fact, I didn't learn a darn thing that I've done in my life. <laughs> so the point is, don't, don't ignore the need to do a thing well, but let that understanding of what is well come from inside. Now, what happens to many devotees, unfortunately, they see people in the world, they begin to think, and it begins with two things, really. It begins with ego and desire. As soon as you begin to think, you have something special. You begin to fall. This woman that I talked about who had this desire to be a musician, I remember her, it was at the Lake Shrine opening back in 1950. 
and uh, she complained at the way something was being sung by the choir beforehand in the rehearsal and so on. And uh, they said, well, what do you mean? It sounds good. She said, my ear tells me. Well, she began to think of her ear as being something special. <laughs> her special talent. Well, I could see there was the germ of what caused her later to fall. And another point concerning her is a very interesting one. She was quite close to Master. When she left, Master said if she had hung in there 24 hours longer, she would have been saved. That's how close she came. It's a very tricky thing. On the one hand, you can't get off the path. On the other hand, you can hardly stay on it. <laughs> Not so easy. It's like a razor's edge. It takes a lot of dedication, a lot of discrimination. One thing that I discovered, and it's perhaps the most important secret of all. You know, when I came to Master, I'd never even heard of gurus before. I'd always had this thought that I knew more than anybody else. I was bright. I was good at arguing. I, I don't know what stupid thing was in my mind that made me feel that I knew more than anybody else, but I certainly hadn't met anybody whose wisdom I could respect enough to really want to listen. I found that they don't have wisdom. I don't either, but I know at least that I don't have it. When I met Master, when I read his book, I knew that was for me. And so from one week when I didn't know the word guru, yoga, karma, all these things that are common currency nowadays among everybody, I had never heard these words. One week later, I was not only his disciple, he had given me his unconditional love, which I find he didn't give to very many. He had asked of me my unconditional love, my unconditional obedience. That was a pretty big step. One week, just like that. But I absolutely knew that was what I wanted. My heart knew. My brain was, wow, confused. I'd have to sit down every 15 minutes and try to think, what am I doing? What's this all about? It didn't make any sense. I had so many questions. And uh, there did come a time when I began to doubt, not that he was my guru, but does he really know these things? It came partly when I was editing his Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And that's why it was such a good thing that I could edit that book years later. Because I would find that he said that this is what it means. Then I would find that he said, but on the other hand, it also means this. I'd really been raised on Aristotelian logic. If a thing is this, it can't be that. It's either or. And I just couldn't put it together. And I didn't doubt him as my guru, but I doubted whether he really understood these things. I couldn't get that thought out of my mind. I believed in him, yes. But there was another thing working at that time, too. It's as if this maya, this veil of maya, had come down over all the disciples. Master later told me, Satan is testing the organization. And I would sometimes feel such a weight on my... On my, it was as if there, was, there were two forces inside me just pulling me in half. Sometimes it was so fierce that I could only just lie on my bed. I didn't have the force to fight it. And what brought me through it was only one thing, not answers to my questions. Those did come later. But the first thing that brought me through was love. You'll find that if you love, as Jesus said, to those who love much, is forgiven. When you love, when you love God, when you love Guru, then you're always headed in the right direction. Never lose your devotion. Why devotion? Why bother to even have devotion? Most people are very devoted, but to ego, to money, to fame, to this thing, blah, blah, blah. that's devotion. They wake up, they find. In fact, that's what brings people on the path finally suffering. Now you might have only suffered a little bit. I hadn't suffered in the usual sense. I'd been born into a well-to-do home. I'd had everything go right for me in life, but I suffered intensely 
because I saw that none of this is what I want. It's all empty. And what happens is, and if you don't understand the law of reincarnation, then it's more difficult <coughs> because you think, well, why suffer? But what happens, in fact, is that in your superconscious, you remember all the suffering that you've been through for incarnations because every single choice that you make, thinking, finally, I've got it, every single choice leads to disappointment and suffering. It cannot do otherwise. I've seen so many people leave and become successful and sort of want to show off their beautiful cars and everything. And I think, what will they be like in a few years? And you see them a few years later and they're pretty dull. As Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. How many people have dead eyes? How many people, but you know it's worse when you've been on the path and when you've found peace and you know what it is and it's right present with you in this incarnation and then you leave it. There's always in your mind that memory of that peace that you lost. You can't find happiness in anything. And so, as Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its flavor, what will salt it? Devotees, when they lose their devotion, devotees, when they lose their peace, what have they got? They can go after that mirage that other people still hope for. They know it's not going to work, and it doesn't work. And I've seen it so often that it doesn't give them what they're looking for, and so they suffer. Now, the path does not mean a place. The path does not mean Ananda, SRF, this church, that church. No. The path is your inner dedication to God. You can have that dedication wherever you are. It would be a mistake to think that if you leave this, like the, the fellow disciples of Buddha, when he was going through those extreme ascetic practices, and he left them because he knew that was not giving him what he was looking for. And finally he found the truth. And three of these devotees saw him, these ascetics saw him, from a distance. I told you this story a few weeks ago. And they thought, oh, he's a fallen soul. We mustn't even look at him. And then they suddenly felt, even as they turned away, there was something in him that didn't seem fallen. It, it was attractive. And so they went and asked him. And he delivered at Sad, Sarnat his first sermon. And as I said the other Sunday, that wasn't his first sermon. His first sermon was just standing there. That was his sermon. People felt in his very presence an aura, an emanation of something powerful. Now that is something that if they thought he'd fallen, they found out he hadn't. It isn't where you are, it's how dedicated you are. But you know, the other side is that if you've found something that is really real and you decide to drift off as if it were just sort of a restaurant, you tried that menu and you wanted to try another, it shows that you never really knew what that restaurant had to offer. You never really knew what that guru and that teaching had to offer. Because a true teaching has power. And that power is something that you can't convey in books. Some people say, well, why? If Kriya is for everybody and is universal. Why can't it be put in a book? That's the reason. Because to, re to really learn it is to learn it, to absorb it as a vibration, as a power. It's a transmittal of power. People who have been, I remember when I first met Master, mind you, I was more than green. And he had his hand on my heart when I finished uh, uh, my vows, and he put his hand on my heart, and his arm was vibrating like this. And I thought, oh God, and I can't feel anything. I was so dull spiritually still, but I had this burning desire. And I have to say that from that moment on, my consciousness changed. 
Yes, it did do something. I wasn't sensitive enough to feel it. Over a period of weeks, I began to feel it very powerfully. That power is what a great path offers. That's what this path offers. We never would say it's the only path, but don't think that you can sort of walk the counter. Once you've found a true path, to drift off to another, in another direction shows insincerity and superficiality. Be respectful of all, but be true to your own way. This is the lesson that the spiritual path must teach. And not many people, not many people reach that point. Not many people, God sends, God helps everybody. And he gives you a beautiful sunset to remind you of his beauty. He gives you the rain to remind you of his sympathetic tears for you. He gives you so many experiences that can inspire. And so you might write poems and uh, other music and so on to express your inspiration and still not know that it's all God. But bit by bit you begin to know well, maybe there's something behind this. And so you begin reading books on spiritual truth and you read all sorts of goofy nonsense. But bit by bit you find yourself led to the right thing. I had the good luck not to read anything, but uh, most people have. I didn't know anything when I came to him, not to speak of yoga. I didn't even know the Bible. I didn't know anything. But most people go through that, and that's God teaching them. And then when they want a little bit more, he brings them to different teachers, and those different teachers can give them good ideas and instructions. But finally, they feel they want something more. Now, not many reach that point. And when you do, and I don't say that everybody who comes here has reached that point, many are still shopping the counter. That's fine. There's no rush. You've got eternity, for God's sake. <laughs> but eternity to suffer, do you really want that? Ah, then it starts to get more, cuts more close to the core, doesn't it? When you realize that the alternative when you look for what you're really looking for and you find that it always lets you down. And finally you know that what you're looking for is your own self and the bliss within you. And when you finally become serious about it, you reach the point where you really do become serious. And I'm, mind you, when I say serious, I don't mean glum. I don't mean solemn and grave, no. Actually, I've never seen happier people than those who are really on the spiritual path. But there is a certain straightness in their, in their eyes, a certain straightness in their consciousness. They know what they want. And people who try to pull them this way and that way, no, I want that. How often my own family, and I suppose your families, most of you, I marvel and envy those of you who have supportive families. Mine was not. Um, but I just said, no, this is what I want. And that's what we have to do. There has to come that point in your life where you're very serious about your aim. And when you reach that point, don't shop around anymore. You can read a little bit for inspiration. I don't say don't. But I say, know what you really want. And what makes you know? Love. What did Judas fall from? Lack of love. He allowed his ego to get into the picture. And with that ego, I want this, I want that, I want the other thing, and so he fell. And as we read in the Bhagavad Gita, it's one step after another. It doesn't happen quickly, but bit by bit you, you become fascinated by one little thing. Think of Zeno's paradox. He said you can never cross the road. Why? Because you have to go halfway before you can reach the other side. Then you have to go halfway of the remaining distance, and then a halfway of the remaining distance. And no matter how close you come, you've still got to go halfway. Of course, it was a logical paradise, Dox, it was sophistry, it wasn't true. We know that what you really do is not go halfway, you just go. It's like that other paradox in Greek philosophy that says that an arrow can't fly because at any given moment 
in its journey, it's still. Well, it isn't still. Movement. It's not a photograph. It's a movie. Well, okay, you, you can tell me, yeah, but a movie has a lot of stills. No, life isn't. It's a constant movement. And so when we understand this, then we realize that the truth is something that we offer ourselves into, offer yourselves into that flow. Love is what gives it to you. And the thought that this thing and that thing and the other thing will do it won't. Now there's some severity on this path too. I didn't see this personally, but one fellow disciple of mine saw a disciple, a man I should say, come to Yogananda and want to be a disciple. And Master said no. And the disciple kept coming to him and asking him. And it wasn't like that man who came to Babaji in the uh, autobiography of a yogi. He wasn't being tested. Master said, absolutely not. Get out of here and never come back. Virtually is how we put it. You might think, well, God, is that the way to talk? Master saw something in him. He saw that he'd actually been a disciple of Sri Yukteswar and had lessons to learn before he could come back. He didn't want to see him waste his time piddling. Once you come, be serious. One man came and wanted to join, and Master wouldn't accept him. And he said to somebody later who said, well, he's a nice person, why don't you bring him? He said, oh, if you could see the karma. There are a lot of deep things. It's no easy thing to get onto the path. You think you choose it. No, God chooses you. But once you choose, if you offer yourself to it, don't waste time. 2,000 years may not be much in eternity, but it's a heck of a long time to suffer. Be true to yourself. Be true to your own calling. And you will see that in that, it is a fall. It's literally a fall, really. Because the, the energy has to rise in the spine. And that which pulls you to the world pulls you down in the spine. And the more your energy goes down in the spine, the more you yourself cannot be happy. The more the energy goes downward, you feel depressed. We have words that say it. I feel low, I feel depressed, I feel heavy, or I feel like soaring, I feel high, I feel uplifted. It's something everybody understands to a certain point. We need to do that which will lift us. There are two ways. You know, Tolstoy said that when you um, go on a journey, the first half is spent looking backward, the second half is looking forward. And this is certainly true on the spiritual path. The first years you spend sort of looking back, not necessarily in nostalgia, but trying to cut those ties. But then it becomes easier and easier. The other begins to attract you, begin to realize that's the reality. And don't think it's always going to be tests. Don't think it's always going to be hardship. Moreover, every test that comes is a cause for gratitude. I can say that with deep conviction. Every test you get is good for you, frees you, helps you to understand things more deeply. Yes, be grateful. But keep your eyes on that pole star, and you will see that sooner or later, Gosh, one time I said to Master, have I been your disciple for thousands of years? He said, it's been a long time, that's all I'll say. <laughs> so long? I said, but sir, does it always take that long? He said, oh yes, desires for this thing and that thing take one away again and again. Don't let it happen again. I asked him when I first came to him, have I been a yogi before? He said, many times. You'd have had to be to be here. That goes for all of you. You'd have had to be in doing these things for you to even be here if you're sincere about it. But don't let it happen again. Once you really put yourself, put your hand to the plow, as Jesus said, don't look back. Go on. You'll see that it becomes easier and easier. And the joy that the saints have expressed is your joy. It's not something for wonder and admiration of them, you've got it. It's a question of becoming that by just looking and going 
in that direction, one step at a time. It doesn't take more, but make that direction always the same one.